your contribution to making the world a better place and also to your university education by being here. Uh, we were having a faculty meeting this afternoon um, and uh, received a wonderful surprise that we want to share with you. Um, this came in by UPS and it said, presented to the students and faculty in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Sonoma State University as a token of our appreciation for your generous gift to the Rwandan children. Your contribution will greatly help in their slow process of recovery with deep gratitude from the Friends of Rwanda Association 2004. So give yourself a hand. how much good we can do that um, next semester in the fall, we're going to have students working in the center uh, for the study of the Holocaust and genocide. And one of the things that we are thinking about doing is um, thinking of some way that we can, can continue to support the children of Rwanda. <coughs> David sent an email to some of us that evidently Channel 5 is uh, Dana, what's her name? Dana Kelly. Right, went to uh, Rwanda and uh, is talking about some of the things that some of the people in the Bay Area are doing and there's so much more that needs to be done. And hopefully as students, if you're still going to be here in the fall and perhaps even if you're not, you can be active in helping us to sustain a relationship with the children of Rwanda and the Friends of the Rwanda Association. So give yourself a big hand. She's a professor of criminal justice at Cal State Stanislaus um, and is the coordinator of their CJ program. Um, and she has a long list of publications to her name, the uh, reading that you had uh, to read was about uh, internet sites, which she co-authored with a colleague of hers at Stanislaus and also our own. Professor Dr. 
Diana Grant. Um, she also does work on juror decision making in hate cases and has published um, an article at Time to Hate, Situational Antecedents of Intergroup Bias. We're most grateful to have Professor Gersenfeld have driven from Stanislaus to come and present her lecture for you today. So I'm going to give her a warm welcome. I'm shorter than everybody. I'm shorter than everybody. Thank you. Hopefully you can all see me over the podium. <laughs> Some podiums are tall. Now I think anybody faces the top of my head. <laughs> so thank you very much, for Myrna, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming here. I know it's almost the end of the semester. I know your brains are full. I know there's lots of things you'd rather be doing than hearing about hate crimes at this point in the year. Um, but I think it's an important topic. And uh, so, to talk about today. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about is who commits hate crimes and also organized hate groups. And I've been researching hate crimes now for, oh, about 12 years. And before I started doing research on it, I had these stereotypes that I think a lot of people share about the people who actually commit hate crimes. And you know, the first thing that came to my mind was somebody in a white robe, you know, with a pointy hat, you know, and they're probably in the South and they're a redneck and that kind of thing. So that the Klan, I think, is, is what comes to people. Another thing that used to come to mind was um, skinheads. I, as, as Myrna said, I went to um, college in Portland. And at the time I went, lived up there, you could go downtown pretty much any time of day and see skinheads just kind of hanging out on the street corners downtown. And, and I didn't know too much about them at the time. They, they were just kind of beginning to get into the news. Um, but I knew that they were associated with hate crimes. And a year after I left Portland to go to Nebraska for graduate school, a group of those skinheads beat to death Malagata Sara, an Ethiopian immigrant in a neighborhood very close to where I lived. So I think that was maybe really what had first um, got my attention, I guess. Um, so those were the stereotypes that I had kind of floating around in my head before I started doing research. Um, and even if those stereotypes were true, the question would arise of why would people do that? Why would people join these groups? Why would people hate somebody so much to join a group committed to hating people and, and hurt other people? Um, so, so that was something I think about. And as I did more research, I learned that those stereotypes, for the most part, are, are pretty false stereotypes. They don't give an accurate picture of who really commits hate crimes. Um, in fact, those traditional groups like the Klan and the skinheads for the most part have gotten rid of those uniforms. So nowadays you could see skinheads and Klan members and you wouldn't necessarily know who they were because they're probably not going to be wearing those, those uniforms. They've they're, they're been making an effort for the last few years to appear more mainstream, to appear more respectable. And so that there was a difference there. Furthermore, there are a lot more hate groups than just those two. Um, I, I think those are the two that, that come to people's mind, but in fact, the, the world of organized hate is a lot more diverse and a lot more complicated than that. And all of these groups, including the National Alliance, uh, which is one of the major groups, they have all these interconnections with one another. It gets very complicated, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. The other thing I learned as I was doing research is that most hate crimes are committed by people who belong to these groups. And the research is still kind of coming in, but probably about 95% of hate crimes are committed by people who don't belong to a hate group. And, and that's plus or minus. And that, that surprised me when I first started learning about that. About 95%. So a very small percentage of hate crimes are actually committed by members of these groups, which doesn't mean they're not influential. They certainly have an impact on the world. But it means that the vast majority of people who are out there hate crimes aren't Klan members. They're not skinheads. Um, they're people a, a lot like you and I, unfortunately. Um, and so that was something that interested me as well. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the major types of hate groups. I'm going to talk a little bit about their history, um, how the groups formed, what they do, how they can have connections with one another. Um, I'll also talk about what, the, what all these groups have in common, because after I spend some time talking about the end, they all have certain sort of threads that they have in common. And I'll also talk a little bit about how these groups go about recruiting members 
and what is it that leads people to be attracted to joining? You know, when somebody leaves a, a thing on your doorstep, does, who, who signs up? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I, towards the end of our time together today, I'm also going to talk about the ordinary people who commit hate crimes. So again, the, the, that silent majority of hate crime offenders. And I'll talk about who the typical offender is and the different hate crime offenders. And then I'm going to leave you with a few conclusions to think about and I hopefully you'll have some questions and comments as we, as we reach towards the end. So I'm gonna begin by giving you sort of an overview about hate groups, I'm sorry. Uh, I just went online the other day and got the newest numbers. The um, Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the things that they do is they track hate groups in the United States and you can go to their webpage and they very kindly let me copy their maps for this. Um, th so they, they track about how many hate groups there are and who's doing what. And they've estimated that in 2003, there were 751 active hate groups in the United States. And they only include among those 751 groups that were actually doing something, so that had rallies or meetings or publications, and things that seemed to be actual groups rather than just an individual. And sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference. I'll show you a map here. And I apologize, this was originally in color, but we don't have a color printer in my department, so. Let's see if I can get this slightly more in focus, that didn't help. Well, in any case, you can get a general idea of the distribution of hate groups. So each of those little symbols stands for a different type of hate group, and the colors, which didn't come out, are, stand for uh, the number of hate, active hate groups in, the United, in each state. And you can see that the, the three states that have the largest number of active hate groups are California, Texas, and South Carolina. Um, and you know this, it would look like sort of the east, the south, and the west are, are the centers of hate and nothing much is going on in the Midwest, but of course, there's not a lot of people there <laughs> either. So you know, those parts, those big empty spaces you see there in places like North Dakota, it's because there's three people in the whole county and they can't think of anybody to hate or something. Um, so, so that's why there's not so many dots there in the middle. There are only two states that, don't, that didn't have a, any active hate groups last year, and those were um, Vermont and South Dakota. And sometimes, some, so even states like Alaska, Hawaii, and North Dakota um, had some active hate groups. Um, California, I have a map here of California. It's estimated that last year California had about 45 active hate groups. Um, and again, you can see the distribution and it's very hard to see the symbols, but the symbols stand for different types of hate groups. And, and just again, population centers, most of the groups are centered around either the Bay Area or LA and San Diego. Um, but the, the little sort of teardrop thing with the eye, those are clan groups. One of those clan groups is right in my neighborhood. It's just north of of my town, it's in a town called Ceres, and I had one of my students interview the, the leader several years ago. It's, it's a very small group, it's him and his wife and a couple of his kids, you know, but, but, but there they are. Um, and some of the groups are obviously more active. The, the black stars, I don't know if you can see those very well, are black nationalist groups. The, um, there's a couple of swastikas on here that are just very, almost impossible to see, but those are some neo-Nazi groups. There is, a there are a couple of boots, which are some skinhead groups, and all those sort of things that look like push pins are in the other category. Um, so a lot of them are patriot organizations, or um, we'll, we'll talk about the other category in a little bit. So that kind of gives an idea of what's going on in California, and certainly California is not immune from these hate groups. It can, it's useful sometimes to talk about different types of hate groups, and I'm gonna do that in a minute, but I wanted to give you a couple of caveats first. First of all, you should keep in mind that the leadership and the membership of these groups are very fluid. People tend to start off with one group, and then they move to another group because they get unhappy with that one. And you know, These are people who hate, and they hate each other too, so they get in fights really easily, so they, they're always splitting off and making different groups, and the membership too, people can, will build several groups at once and move from one to another trying to find one that fits their own personal philosophy. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Another important thing to keep in mind is that in recent years there's been an urging among some of the leaders in organized hate for what they call leaderless resistance 
or lone wolf hate. Basically, they're urging people to either act on their own or act in very small groups that don't have connections to other groups. And the idea is it makes it a lot harder for law enforcement and other agencies to track to crack down on them if they're, if they're isolated like that. And it's, it's very difficult to know what's going on with those people. Um, so keep, keeping that in mind, there are some real differences between these groups. This is from a book. Um, This is from a book called um, Blood in the Face. If you're interested in kind of a, um, a not too academic book about hate, organized hate, this is a good choice for you. And, I, I, and it's, it's kind of graphic, the, the connections between some of these groups. And it didn't come up off of my Xerox here, but you can kind of see it at the top. It's, it's the, the clan being the oldest one, and since then a number of different clans. But off to the side, we see that it's kind of branched off. You can help me with my my focus just a little bit. Thank you. We don't have fancy machines. In fact, I couldn't even get a light bulb head in my classroom last week. Thank you. That's much better. So you can see there's a number of different groups. There's the different clan groups. There's the John Birch Society, sort of a traditional right-wing organization. And there's a number of other groups, too, that have splintered off. There's the Nazis, the neo-Nazis, the skinheads, the Posse Comitatus, Aryan nations. And they all have these different connections. And the same leaders are often involved with those. And we'll, I'll talk more about that a little bit as I go on. Um, this is a little bit easier to see. When Dr. Grant and Dr. Chang, my other colleague, and I did uh, the research looking at hate websites, we found that, it was, that they fell into eight broad categories. And this gives you an indication what they are. Um, there's the clan, Christian identity, and I'll talk about each one of these in individually. It's militias, neo-Nazis, Holocaust deniers, white nationalists, and then there's just sort of an other category. And those, that sort of tangle there of lines is meant to give you an indication of the connections these groups have with one another. So you can see that the clan has lots of connections with all these groups, whereas militias tend to be less connected to the other types of groups. But again, it varies a lot from individual and individual to group to group. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the clan. It is the oldest organized hate group in, in the United States. It was uh, founded in 1865, so immediately after the, the end of the Civil War, within a few months. And it was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, and the group of people who founded it were c Confederate war um, or Confederate um, soldiers. Um, they were, and Forrest, you might have heard of, of Nathan Bedford Forrest. He was one of the, the original leaders. And what the, the name Ku Klan, it's, it's sort of a play on a Greek term. Kuklos means circle in Greek. So they took the word circle, ku close, and changed it to ku klux, and then they just added the clan part. And all of, them, all of these men had belonged to fraternities when they were in college, and so they were kind of influenced by the whole fraternity thing, so that's why they had the Greek thing and all the sort of secret symbols and all of that. Fraternities were popular in the South at the time, so that, that was sort of the model that they, that they based it on. And the purpose of the Klan was very clear from the very beginning. They wanted to maintain power over the newly freed, freed slaves in the South. So their goal was to terrorize um, the freed blacks and to keep them in their place, so to speak. Um, and they were immediately very popular in southern states. And lots and lots of people joined. They only lasted, though, till 1869. Um, and a number of different things happened that we don't have time to go into, but in 1869. Um, since that time, they've, the Klan has had numerous reincarnations, and they'll get, it gets started up again, and they'll get popular for a while, and then for various reasons, it'll die out again. And today, we're in really the, depending on how you count, either the third or the fourth edition of the Klan. Um, and also, it's, people tend to think of the Klan as the Klan, and in fact, it's, an, it's numerous groups that all use that term, and a lot of them don't have anything to do with it, actually. Um, but membership in the Klan in the United States peaked the second time it was created, recreated, which was in the early 1920s. And this was uh, 
there were two things I think that really led to the popularity of the Klan at this point. One was World War I. World War I had just ended. And you know, anytime you get involved in, with a war, as we know now, um, there's a lot of xenophobia, a lot of, you know, of emphasis on patriotism, a lot of distrust of anybody who you see as the American. And so that certainly contributed to that. The other thing that contributed really heavily to the popularity of the Klan was a movie. It's called The Birth of a Nation. And you might check, uh, uh, Stanislaus, we actually have that on DVD in our library. It is available on DVD now. The thing about A Birth of a Nation was it was the first full-length motion picture, which was a big deal in 1915 when the movie came out. People paid up to $2 a piece in 1915 to go see this movie. That was a lot of money then. And you know, if you ignore the message of the movie, it, the cinema fee was very um, radical. It, 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 when, it, when the movie played, of course, they didn't have sound. There would be a 30-piece orchestra playing with it. And it uses all sorts of techniques. It has special effects. And it's, it's, it, it's kind of amazing what they could do almost 100 years ago. And millions and millions of people went to see this movie. And unfortunately, the whole message of the movie, the whole, it was, it was taking place. It's about the rise of the South and the greatness of the South. And it has a whole sort of subplot um, about a, a young white woman who is attacked by black men and how the Klan comes to, comes to rescue her and in fact rescue the South from the, from the blacks. And this is what people went, went to go see. They, they had a special screening of this in the White House um, and it really influenced people's thoughts about, about race and about the South. And so people started joining the Klan largely influenced by this. And, and these people who were joining weren't just in the South. The Klan became very popular in the Midwest at this point as well. It was so popular, um, Warren G. Hart, President of the United States, he was sworn in to the, uh, to the Klan in a White House ceremony. Um, and there were a lot of leaders, reportedly at least one Supreme Court Justice of the time was also a member. And you know, local law enforcement, local government leaders all throughout the country belonged to the Klan. And the, they had millions of members. Eventually they died out again and then were reincarnated during the Civil Rights era. Um, Today, there are multiple clans, as I said, scattered throughout the United States and even in countries, which is kind of odd. Um, the clans, these clans feud with each other frequently. They, some of them prefer a message of peace and love. They say, well, we're not a hate group. We're a love group. We love the white race. We don't hate anybody. Whereas some of the other groups are more militant. Um, so that's led to some conflict between you know, who's the real clan and that kind of thing. It's been... Um, it's served as the starting place for a lot of people who have gone on elsewhere within organized hate. People like David, and uh, who I'll talk about in a little bit, Tom Metzger, who runs an organization, one, probably one of the more militant racist organizations, white Aryan resistance, but they both started out in the Klan. Here's a, a couple of examples of web pages. From, from, this is from the um, Imperial Clans of America's website. And you can't read that. So. <laughs> Let me read it for you. It says, we from the Imperial Clans of America are a law-abiding organization that are honorable Aryan men and women, ones who, can, who we can count on for the future, Christ, race, and our great Aryan nation. Men and women who have courage and principles who will take a stand for what they believe in when the times get hard. We want people who aren't afraid to speak their minds about what is wrong with America. We want people who will stand tall and proud for the future of faith, folk, clan, and nation. We will not tolerate drug users, dealers, thieves, child molesters, abusers, or anyone with immoral character in our movement. Our purpose is to unite, organize, and educate the white Aryan masses worldwide to the dangers that face our race and our great Christian civilization. And then it goes on. The IK IKA is not about hate. We are a Christian organization. The truth is that we are about love of one's own kind. We are here to preserve the rights of the white race. Many organizations exist to better the rights and conditions of the minority. How many stand up for the whites' rights? Not many. That would be considered evil and hateful by the media. Then it goes on. When was the last time you heard of yet another black man getting away with murder? Probably today. You see these black beasts all the time with our white women, constant rise in rapes and murders committed against our white race, and there will continue to be a rise until you stand up and say, that's it, I've had enough. Also, I'm sure you've noticed homosexuality is also on the rise. You say that we are just being hateful again? Not quite, think about this, and it, it goes on from that point on. Um, this is also from their website. 
It says, disclaimer, if you are not of the white race, this website is not for the likes of you. We reserve the right of free speech to state our views. Enemies like it or not. The IKA hates muds, spicks, kikes, and niggers. This is our God-given right. In no way do we advocate violence. We believe in educating our people to the monopolistic Jewish control of the world's banks, governments, and media. White education is what Zog hates. That's the Zionist occupational government. And why it tries to imprison white racialists. So that gives you kind of a tenor for what, what you tend to find on, on the websites. Um, one of the biggest Klan groups today is run by a man named Tom Robb. Uh, it's the Knights of the KKK, they're in Arkansas. And an interesting thing about the Klan today is that they're strongly affiliated with the next group I'm about to talk about, which is Christian identity. Many of the, you, you hear that sort of Christian stuff being um, thrown about on their website, and many of these, these groups are Christian identity groups. So let's talk about Christian identity. This is from a Christian identity website. Christian identity, it's a religious sect. Um, it's not normal mainstream Christian. I've, sometimes I talk about, and I always get some student who says, but I'm, I don't feel like this. This isn't normal mainstream Christianity. Um, it originated in the late 19th century as something called British Israelism. The British Israelism taught that the true chosen people were the, were the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and w then what happened was it immigrated, the, the, the philosophy immigrated to the United States. And in the 1940s, a guy named Wesley Smith or excuse me, Wesley Swift, founded something called the Church of Jesus Christ Christian um, in Lancaster, California. And he, the Church of Jesus Christ Christian was the first identity church in the United States. After he died, a guy named Richard Butler took over. And Richard Butler is the same person who later founded a group called Aryan Nations that you might have heard of, which I'll talk more about in a bit. Um, basically, what identity teaches is that Again, the Nordic peoples and Anglo-Saxon peoples are the true chosen people. Um, and there's two branches of Christian identity. One branch, the sort of manch, teaches that the people who call themselves Jews are sort of imposters, they're Khazars, they're people of Mongolian descent, and they're not really the chosen people. That's the milder branch. The uh, more militant branch of Christian identity teaches that, in fact, um, Eve in the Garden of Eden had an, actually had sex with the snake, which was Satan, and the offspring of that was Cain. And Jew, the people who call themselves Jews today are Cain's descendants. So the Jews are really the spawn of Satan. They also teach that people of color, anybody who isn't a sort of white Aryan, um, were created before Adam. They were created on the fifth day before Adam was, and they, they refer to them as mud people or pre-Adamic peoples. Um, and so they're not even really quite human according to, according to Christian identity theology. And Christian identity is very popular among other organized hate people. Uh, as I mentioned already, lots of the clans are Christian. Tom Robb, the guy who runs the biggest clan organization, is a Christian identity pastor. But it's also popular among a bunch of other different hate groups, Aryan Nations, the Posse Comitatus, um, some militia groups today are, are identity, and some other groups you might have heard of, the Order, which was active in the 80s. Um, their, their leader ended up getting, they, they committed several crimes, including a, a murder, um, and their leader ended up getting shot by the FBI, or killed by the FBI. Some of the neo-Nazi organizations, the National Alliance, they are Christian identity, which is odd because the Nazis themselves were not particularly Christian, but the neo, some of the neo-Nazis could. Randy Weaver, the guy who was killed at Ruby Ridge in Idaho, he was Christian identity. So it's kind of infiltrated a lot of organized hate. And it, there's a couple of reasons why I think it's particularly attractive. I think the main reason is it puts this theological seal on racism. You know, you're not just a bigot anymore, you're just spreading God's word. You know, God says you're better than everybody else. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it's popular. Um, the other part of it is that part of its teachings, they say that you know, the chosen people, these Aryan people, are engaged in this apocalyptic struggle with, with Satan's spawn. It's you know, the great battle of good and evil with capital G and a capital E. So the people who are involved in the organized hate can tell themselves, we are, you know, we are soldiers, and they'll use that terminology, we are soldiers doing God's will, you know, fighting the great war. And so it's, it's an attractive um, philosophy for a lot of these people. Another uh, group 
um, that you've probably heard a lot about are the skinheads. Um, oh, and before I move on, this says, conquer we must for our cause is just. This is from the King Kingdom Identity. It's one of the, it's a, and it says, um, Kingdom Identity Ministries is a politically incorrect Christian identity outreach ministry to God's chosen race, true Israel, the white European peoples. We proclaim the gospel of the kingdom through books, tracts, tapes, videos at the American Institute of Theology, blah, 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 blah. Um, they have a prison ministry. Um, the elect remnant Christian patriots, nationalists, res reconstructionists, racialists, and all seeking a higher level of understanding will learn biblical solutions to personal and national problems and be given keys to unlock this. Like, again, that gives an idea of what they're thinking. But to move on to the skinheads. Um, the skinheads, like the Christian identity, started off in England. Uh, they started off as a, an unorganized youth movement, kind of like the hippie movement in the United Kingdom in the 1960s. So at the same time that hippies and the mods and some other groups were popular in England, the skinheads started. And what the, the thing about the skinheads is it was a working class movement. They were very deliberately working class. They wore working class clothing. They would um, wear jeans or sometimes work pants, work boots, always heavy work boots. Doc Martens became popular eventually. Um, either, uh, usually just plain white t-shirts, work shirts, and they'd shave their heads. And the, the shaving the heads thing, there's two theories about how that started. One was that, you know, it was so they wouldn't get their hair cut in the heavy machinery they were supposedly using on their jobs. And the other th theory is that it's so nobody could yank their hair during fights. So it's unclear exactly how they started the head shaving, but but they were, as I said, they were they very adopted this working class persona, and they were influenced by um, by mods, which was another sort of youth movement in England at the time, the punks, and the punks became popular in the 70s, and also they were influenced by Ru the Rude Boys, which were Jamaican gangs in England at the time. The original skinheads were not particularly racist; they were anti elitist. They were often violent, but they weren't particularly racist, but they started evolving in the 70s, in the early 70s. And who they primarily chose on in England were um, gays and, and people from Pakistan. And because the gays, I guess, because, because it was a way for them to prove their masculinity, and the, they called it packy bashing. And I think that was as, um, because that they, they said these people are taking our jobs, and so that, that, that was the, the reason there. Um, also at this time, they became heavily influenced by, by Nazi uh, rhetoric, by Nazism. The skinhead first came states in the 1980s. It kind of came, saddled along with the whole punk thing. I, I was punk for a while in the 80s, you know. I wasn't a skinhead, but you know, at the same time that punk was popular and I was going around, you know, wearing safety pins in my ears and appalling my parents, that was also the time that skinheads were coming to the US and it kind of came as, because the music was, was similar. The skinheads listened to something called oi music, it's O-I, which um, it's kind of a combination of like heavy metal and punk, most of it. Um, the first two organized skinhead gangs in the United States were Romantic Violence, which was in Chicago, and the American Front, which was in San Francisco. So they weren't going for sort of that stereotype clan territory of the South. The skinheads were and still primarily are an urban phenomenon, and primarily in the West Coast and the Northeast. Um, the Romantic Violence and American Front. And these particular groups broke up pretty quickly, but the members went on to form other groups. And, this as a whole are not very organized. They tend to, you know, they're, they're more like sort of informal street gangs than anything else, and they tend to, to morph rather easily. And this was a period of time, the 80s, when it, uh, hate groups in general in the United States were popular. We were seeing a big increase in the hate movement. It was also the period of time that hate crime laws were being passed in the United States, so there was, there, there was a lot of attention being paid to it. In 1991, which was probably the peak of in skinhead groups, there were 144 active skinhead gangs in the United States. Last year, there were 39. So there has been a very rather steep increase, decrease in numbers of skinheads, which it doesn't mean necessarily that the individuals have seen the light and gone on to peace and brotherly love. Um, a lot of them have moved on to other aspects of organized hate. Nowadays, a lot of skinheads don't shave their heads anymore, and they've kind of abandoned that traditional uniform. 
but they still keep working class image. They try to really think of themselves. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Movies like American History X, and it, you know, it's, it, which came out after the peak of popularity, but that certainly was there. And, and it's, Geraldo was a major <laughs> um, contributor, I think, to the popularity. Of Geraldo and some of the other talk shows, and these people would appear. And nobody had ever heard of it. Then they'd appear and they'd become sort of stars. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as, as I was saying, most of them they, they still keep that sort of working image, even though if you look at where they come from. Most of them actually come from very middle class backgrounds. Um, and they're still violent. Traditionally, the skinheads have been very violent. You know, what, the, what skinheads traditionally like to do is get drunk, usually Budweiser. I don't know why. That's like the official skinhead beer. And, um, and beat people up, <laughs> and, um, which is when the work boots come in handy. Um, skinheads do tend to associate somewhat with some of the other organized hate groups, and some of the leaders of organize, other organizers have tried to use the skinheads to accomplish their means because the skinheads tend to be younger and more militant, and more violent. So they've seen that as a way to, to sort of accomplish. Tom Metzger, I mentioned him before. He, he runs a group called White Aryan Resistance down in Fallbrook. And in the 80s, he sent some of his minions up to Oregon to try and, or, to Portland, to try and organize the skinheads up there. And he, they were basically sort of encouraging them to behave violently. It was a group of those skinheads, skinheads who ended up beating Milligan to death. Subsequently, um, Tom Metzger was sued by the family of the, of the uh, murdered man and got, he represented himself. Um, if you can get a hold of a copy of it, that you can actually, there's actually a videotape available of it. It's called Hate on Trial, and you can watch him representing himself. Um, he lost. They got a $12.5 million judgment against him. He doesn't have $12.5 million. So he's a TV repairman. Um, but since then, he's been uh, a little bit less obvious in his behavior, although he's still pretty out there. I should also mention, with regard to skinheads, that there is a whole branch of the skinhead movement called SHARP, and this, these are the anti-racist skinheads. It's, uh, SHARP stands for Skinheads Against race, Racial Prejudice. And SHARP skinheads can be, they, they, they come, they're members of a number of different races, sexual orientations, religions, and what they mainly do is look for the racist skinheads and get in fights with them. But uh, they listen to a very similar type of music. They also listen to oi music, but oi music with cyst lyrics. Um, so the, the sh so it is important when you're, if you're ever doing any research on skinheads to make sure and distinguish whether it's a racist skinhead group or a non-racist skinhead group, because there is a very sharp distinction between them. Although they're both, what they both share is listening to the same type of music, and the sharps are also very working class, anti-elitist. Um, and here's a, oh, a skinhead web page. And it, again, it's hard to see sort of a, a, a drawing of these very militant looking guys. Underneath it, it says, get out of Iraq. Um, and some of these very far right groups have found brotherhood with some of the far left on the whole war with Iraq thing, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Another group, uh, um, the next group I wanted to talk about were militias. Um, and, and it is really just like talking about skinheads to note, not all militias are racist militias. In fact, there are many militia members who are members of various ethnic minorities. However, a lot of the militias are and were racist. What all the militia groups share is a deep distrust of government, especially the federal government. They also tend to not trust state government very much, and some of them don't even trust local government. Um, what the racist militias believe is that the federal government is part of the Jewish conspiracy, that the Jews run the federal government. That's why they refer to it as Zog, the Zionist occupational government. Uh, Jews run the federal government um, as a way of achieving the Jewish conspiracy and, and so forth. Um, the, the militia movement was very popular in the mid-90s. And again, the, the sort of media uh, really fueled this as well. In 1996, there were 858 active militia groups in the United States. Today, there's about 45, so a very steep drop. There are also today about 125 groups that they call patriot groups. Um, some of them are militia groups. Some of them are tax protesters. Some of them have these common law courts. They're, they're kind of a diverse group. Um, 
The militia groups became really popular. I think the media really led to their popularity, and there were a couple of events that particularly did. One was the, the whole deal up at Ruby Ridge in, in Idaho, where the Weaver, who as I mentioned before, were adherents to Christian identity. Um, Randy Weaver got in trouble. The, the feds suspected him of some, of some illegal arms stuff, and the feds sort of had a standoff there at their very isolated home, ended up killing um, Weaver's wife and his son um, and his dog and injuring Weaver. Uh, it was a long standoff. And there was, a, 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 I think one FBI agent was also killed during the whole thing. And there were a lot of people that were horrified that you know a child and a woman were killed and he, I mean, his baby was there, there were kids there. And so that, that upset people. They saw that as an example of being the, the government coming on too strong. The other thing that happened very sh around the same time was, was Waco. And if you remember the Branch Davidians, and you know, we could all watch on TV. Some of you may be too young. Um, but, but you remember watching on TV and you could actually see it, the building burning and you know, the TV people talking about the, all the children who died in there. And again, there was a thing that this was abuse of power on the part of the federal government. Um, and, um, in 1995, the Oklahoma City Federal Building was blown up. A and the individuals involved were loosely affiliated with some of the militia groups and some of the other racist organizations and had been influenced by a book called The Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries is a science fiction work by a guy named William Pierce. Um, William Pierce founded the Alliance, the, that, that other group. And the Turner Diaries takes place in the near future when there is a revolution and the whites, um, there's a race war, essentially. And it talks about the bombing of federal buildings. It talks about hanging of race traitors. <coughs> Excuse me. So that obviously that really popularized that. Uh, you may also remember the, the Montana Freeman a group up in Montana was a militia group, and they got a lot of press at the time. So we were hearing about militias at this time, and they became popular. Um, as I said, they've really declined rapidly in popularity since then. People either got sick of them, felt that they weren't accomplishing anything, or didn't like the bad press, felt they were too militant. Um, then and now, the remaining militia groups are often allied with tax protesters. In, in my home county, Stanislaw County, we had an incident several years ago. What some of these people like to do is they file these property liens. You know, if you have a lien against your property, or it would be somebody like some uh, construction person you owed money to, if you have this lien against a, your property, it's very difficult for you to sell your house or other property. And what they would do is go around putting liens against the property of people that they didn't like. And they attempted, in, in my home county, they attempted to file some of these false liens against the property of some local judges and people. And the county recorder refused to, to file that paperwork. And a couple of the, these individuals um, attacked in her garage, sexually assaulted her, beat her up very severely. Um, so that was sort of a, a local thing in my county, but, but in general they, they tend to be associated with these tax protesters. And they've also, some of the militia groups also are strongly associated with some of the militant anti-abortion groups. Um, the guy whose name escapes me for the moment, the, the guy who did the bombing at the Olympics. Thank you, Rudolph, um, who is a very militant anti-abortion person is also associated. Wondering why on earth he would he would, uh, why he cared about the Olympics, it's part of that was, well, that's part of the new world order that the militia people don't like. You know? So, and again, the militias are very much reduced in influence today. Um, the next group I wanted to talk about was the neo-Nazis. And these are groups that um, espouse the national socialist rhetoric and agenda. These folks have been around in the United States as long as Nazism has existed. The first Nazis in the United States were here, right? First Nazis were in Germany. Um, a few of the famous ones you might have heard about, one of the early influential ones was a guy named George Lincoln Rockwell. And after World War II, he started the American Nazi Party. And they were, he was in the news a lot. Um, and he, he particularly hated Jews and gays. And he was eventually actually uh, killed by a, a, a former member of his group. Um, more recently, some of the influential groups have included William Pierce, who I mentioned before, in the National Alliance. Now, the National Alliance, William Pierce, 
uh, in July of 2002. And since then, the National Alliance, which had been a very influential organization, has been somewhat in disarray. So it's surprising me a little bit to see that they're out leafleting because it was unclear who's, there's kind of a couple of branches and they're not really doing too much nowadays. Maybe they're resurrecting themselves. Um, another active neo-Nazi group has been um, the Aryan Nations. And again, Richard Butler, who was that Christian identity guy, started Aryan Nations. They were active um, primarily in Idaho was their headquarters. They had a whole found in Idaho. He got sued a few years ago um, because of some events that took place at the Area Nations compound. And they lost their property. Um, it ended up getting sold. The, the proceeds went to this woman who was beaten by some of the Area Nations followers. And now it's a, some sort of holistic conference retreat or something or other. Um, Butler's still in Idaho, but the, but the group itself is kind of in tatters. And there's a couple of, there's still some Aryan Nations people in Idaho, and there's some in Pennsylvania because they decided you know, it was wider than Idaho or something like that, and they decided to go there. And so there's a couple sort of competing Aryan Nations groups. Um, another, sort of, I, I hesitate to even call this an, a, a neo-Nazi group because it's really just a person. There's a guy, he calls himself Gerhard Lauk. His name's actually Gary Lauk. He lives in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I went to graduate school, and he runs the National Socialist I forget the, his abbreviation, it's long. Anyway, a, a neo-Nazi group. And he has actually, he served some time in prison in Germany um, for, for distributing neo-Nazi materials there. He's back in the United States right now. I believe he's got a website. And he's, I, I think it's mostly just him, um, but he, he, he distributes a lot of stuff. And um, here's an example from the Aryan, this is from the Aryan Nations website. You can see the Aryan Nation symbol, and it says uh, fighting Jewish takeover, takeover for over 25 years. And the quote directly underneath it is a quote from Hitler, from Mein Kampf, and, it's, and the quote says, I believe I am acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator. By defending myself against the Jew, I am fighting for the work of the Lord. Underneath it, under latest news, the headline is Jew government ready to attack Aryans. That was April 23rd. I don't know where that happened, but um, anyway. And you can, you can show your support for the th Fourth Reich with a, a picture you can download to use as wallpaper on your computer, a picture of beautiful northern lake with misty mountains. Um, so that's an example of one of the modern neo-Nazi groups. Another um, influential group, and this is one that really hasn't had many connections to the other organizations, are the Holocaust denial deniers. They, they prefer to call themselves revisionists. Um, and they come in a few sort of flavors, or they make several different arguments. Some of them just plain up argue that the Holocaust never happened. The whole thing is a hoax, and it's a hoax by the Jewish people to further conspiracy to get sympathy and money for Jews. In fact, they, sometimes they call it the hol hola hoax, or they call it the Holocaust, and they, ch they, uh, they replace the S with a dollar sign. So there's that branch of it. Then there's another branch of Holocaust denial people who said, okay, well, pe some people died but not that many. And besides that, they weren't deliberately killed. They died of illness and things in the camps. And nobody was really trying to wipe them out. And then there are other group of people, and some of these other people also do this, that say, well, you know, forget about the Holocaust. It's the Jews who are the real perpetrators of, of genocide. And they'll either talk about the Russian Revolution or the situation right now in Israel and Palestine. And this is, I'm going to read you just an excerpt, just to give you again an idea of the flavor here of, of, of what these people say. This is by somebody named, uh, it's a piece called from, uh, from Jews are real perpetrators in Russia or Palestine, or excuse, is it from the White Holocaust is the title of it, and the author's name is V.S. Harrell. Every white school child in America has heard of the so-called Jewish Holocaust in which millions of Jews were supposed to have been murdered by white Christian Germans during the Jew-instigated World War II. Yet few, if any, could tell you of the true Holocaust or Holocausts of the last two centuries per perpetrated by Jews against the white race, which has resulted in the death of over one billion white people, as we shall prove hereafter. The fact remains that even though the highly inflated official number of Jewish deaths during the so-called Holocaust is officially now three and a half million, the estimates of white Christian deaths at the hand of the communist Zionist Jews in Russia are as high as 45 million just since the Bolshevik rev Revolution in Russia. Millions were starved to death by Stalin and his Jewish regime, just as millions are being murdered by genocide today. 
Yet few have heard of these horrors perpetrated by the mongrel Jews against the white race. Their hatred for Christianity and Jesus Christ has compelled the Jews to institute policies of genocide which are in force at all times. Despite the inaccurate and false portrayals of Hitler and National Socialism by the Jews, it is the Jews who are the true monsters, the true murderous devils. Jews and their Zionist vehicle of communism have been responsible for the deaths of millions of white people, men, women, and children. The majority of communists are Jews, and it is a fact of history that Karl Marx and his closest advisors were all Antichrist Jews. The Antichrist Jews forced the communist change in Russia by slaughtering millions of bourgeoisie who had no desire to be ruled by Jewish communism. And it goes on from there. Some of the more famous, the, um, <laughs> the Holocaust revisionists just held a conference in Sacramento on April 24th. A big national, international conference actually, I believe it was. So they are active locally. Some of the famous names, Willis Cardo was one of the earlier uh, Holocaust denial people. He founded an organiza organization called the Institute for Historical Review. And a lot of these people, they try to make themselves sound very scientific and official. So they'll give it these names like the Institute for Historical Review. Or they'll point out that they, they'll call themselves doctor something. And, or oh, I've got a PhD. You know, the PhD might be in something having nothing to do with history or it might be in, in engineering or something like that. But, um, but they try to make themselves sound scientific. Some of the other influential people, there's a guy named Arthur Butts who's a professor at Northwestern and he published a book uh, denying, he, he's a, a, I think he's a, a professor of chemical engineering or something and he claims that it's, that the, again, he's got all sorts of science to claim that the gas chambers couldn't possibly have worked. Um, um, some other famous names, there's a guy named Ernst Zendel. He's a, a Canadian and he has, he's uh, currently in prison, although I believe he should be getting out soon, um, because in Canada it's illegal to deny that the Holocaust happened. And his, what, because of his website, there's some interesting legal things because technically his website was on an American server, a US server, but he was convicted of violating Canadian law and he's in prison up there. Another influential person is a guy named Bradley Smith. He runs a group called CODA, the Committee for Open the Holocaust. And what he does a lot of is putting, he used to, he's done less of it recently, put ads um, in campus newspapers um, denying the Holocaust. Um, here's, let's see. This is. Was there? He hasn't been doing much for the last couple of years. For a while he was doing a lot. This is from his, his website, the CODA website. Um, and as I said, they often rely heavily on pseudoscience. If you're interested in people, there is a movie I can highly recommend to you. It's called Dr. Death, The Rise and Fall of Fred A. Leuchter, Jr. It's, uh, it was made in 1999. The Errol Morris, the same guy who, who did, has done a number of other documentaries, did this. Um, and it's, it's good. It's really good. And Leuchter is a guy who doesn't have a degree in much of anything for various reasons, ended up helping several states um, improve their death chambers for, for people who were getting the death penalty. And who ended up getting involved with these, with these Holocaust denial people, went to one of the concentration camps, and I can't remember which one, might have been Treblinka, and claimed to get a sample there, and then he claimed to test it for residue, and he came up with the, the Leuchter report, in which he, he claimed scientifically that, that it, ne it never happened. Um, it's, it's a, it's odd to say this, but it's actually a really entertaining documentary. You can see what, what type of person the science is, is based on, so I can, I can highly recommend it. And I know you can at Blockbuster. Um, the um, Holocaust denial people are generally not well linked to the other hate groups. And in fact, a lot of them claim, oh, we don't hate anybody, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just looking for the truth. Um, but even though they don't, might not have any direct links, their claims are often adopted by the organized groups, and they use it to support their own their things, so they're heavily influential. The, uh, the next category is sort of a catch-all category, and these are journalists. And this is just a broad category of different groups that just generally advocate white supremacy. Most of them want white separatism. They would like to maintain a, the United States or a portion of the United States as a white country. There are a lot of white nationalist groups internationally as well. Um, one of the more prominent ones I've mentioned to you already is Tom Metzger's uh, War. Um, another one that's been influential, there's a guy named Don Black, used to be a Klan guy. He runs a, web, a website, and Stormfront 
serves as a portal to a bunch of other um, white supremacist web website and web material. So it's one of the, and it was one of the earliest uh, hate sites on the internet. Um, David Duke, some of his groups fall in this category. David Duke was originally in the Klan, later on formed a group called the National Association for the Advancement of White People, had some falling out there, now leads a group called EURO, which stands for the European American Unity and Rights Organization. And um, he's actually get due to get out of prison any day now um, on some mail fraud charges. But, before, but previously, he was a, Congress, a state um, representative in Louisiana, and he ran for Louisiana governor at one point. So he was actually gotten into mainstream politics. Didn't win governor, but got a lot of votes. Um, and what's interesting, I think, about some of the white nationalist groups is some of them have opened a dialogue with other nationalist groups, including black nationalist groups and of Islam, but also more recently, including some of the uh, militant Islamic groups, which is just kind of interesting. <laughs> People who that you wouldn't think they would ordinarily be talking to, but they actually share a lot of common ideas. And here's a, a, an example. This is the Stormfront. Stormfront.org. Their web page. You can't read it on the left, so I'll read it to you. It's some of the links, they have a discussion scholarship competition, um, something called What is Racism, where they talk about really it's Jews and minorities who are the real racists, a text library, a graphics library, they have a women's page, they have a kids page, and a bunch of other, and lots of links to other groups. The final group I wanted to mention isn't really a group at all, it's just a category, it's other. It's all the groups that don't fit into any other category. And there's a wide, there are a wide variety of different groups involved here. Um, one large category, the Neo-Confederates. And these are groups primarily in the South that would like to see some sort of return of the Confederacy. And again, they'll often say, oh, we're not really racist, we're just interested in states' rights, or we're just in you know, Southern pride and Southern heritage. And you see a lot of, they, they get involved in the whole debate over the, uh, the Confederate flag. Um, but in fact, a lot of them are really racist. And they're not just in the South, although they're more active there. There's actually quite a few of them in the West, including California. Another group that up until recently has been influential is a group, they were called the World Church of the Creator. Then they got sued because there was another church that wasn't racist called the World Church of the Creator, so then they changed their name to the Creativity Movement. And they were run by a guy named Matthew Hale. And they taught that basically white Aryan people are incarnations of God. They weren't Christian, they were sort of pagan, I guess. And um, their leader, Matthew Hale, went to law school in, in Illinois they, the state of Illinois wouldn't let him get a, uh, wouldn't let him take, the, they took the bar exam and passed it, but they wouldn't license him as an, so he was involved in this whole long, messy set of lawsuits associated with that. And then um, more recently, he got sent away to prison. In fact, he was just convicted the other day, I think last week, for um, he was trying to conspire to murder one of the judges who was involved in one of his lawsuits. Um, He's going to be gone for some time. He was convicted on several counts of that. He hasn't been sentenced yet, but he'll be gone for a while. And his group has pretty much broken down. Um, some of the other groups that are in the other category, there's a whole large group, a large conglomeration of anti-immigration groups. And again, a lot of these claim, oh, we're not racist. Um, an interesting thing about some of the anti-immigration groups is that they've recently begun, uh, they've begun, they've been successful at trying to take over the Sierra Club. The current Sierra Club president is affiliated with immigration groups, many of which are racist, and they've tried to become a majority on the Sierra Club Board of Directors. And the thing is they say, well, it's an environmental issue. We don't want people, too many people immigrating to the United States because, you know, that's bad for the environment. Um, so that's how they get, get into the Sierra Club, which is, seems, again, like an odd sort of thing. Um, another, there's the John Birch Society, which is an old school, primarily anti-communist, but also other kind of far-right stuff. There are also prison gangs. There are a lot of racist prison gangs. Shouldn't surprise us too much. Um, some of which are affiliated with some of these other groups I've talked about, but many of which are, are run more along the lines of traditional gangs. And then there are some um, non-white extremist groups. For example, there's a group in Southern California called the Nation of Aztlan. It's a Mexican-American extremist group. They don't like pretty much anybody, they particularly hate Jews. 
There are a number, there's a number of black militant groups. There's the Jewish Defense League, which is a Jewish militant group. Um, some leaders of that were um, put in prison a, a few years ago for um, attempting to bomb the offices of Congressman Darrell Issa. And one of their leaders ended up hanging himself for, while he was in prison. Um, another, another branch of the sort of other category is something called the third positionists who are gaining some prominency worldwide. The third positionists, they're an interesting group. They're fascist, they're racist, and they're anti-Semitic. So have adopted these sort of traditional far-right ideals, but they've also adopted a number of traditional far-left ideals. That's why they call themselves the, th the third position. They're neither right nor left. They are anti-corporate, they tend to be pro-environment, um, and anti-elitist. So they're kind of an interesting group. So I think that kind of gives you an idea of what the, the geography looks like in, among organized hate groups. And you might be wondering at this point what diversity of groups have in common. So briefly, I wanted to tell you that there are some things that they have in common. And um, one is, and the, probably the main one, is they all would like to maintain traditional power hierarch hierarchies. You know, it's not an accident that the main claim of these groups is white power. They're very concerned with losing power or they think they've already lost it. So that's, that's really one of their main focuses. And you know, they may vary over who they think is, take, who they think is threatening their power. They think they should, uh, should maintain that power, but that seems to be a, a main thing. Another thing that they all have in common is, is anti-Semitism, um, uh, other than <laughs> the Jewish Defense League, obviously. Um, I was at a, a conference on hate crimes in March and someone, someone there referred to anti-Semitism as the glue that holds white supremacism together because they may disagree on lots and lots of other things but the one thing they can all agree on is they all hate Jews. And they can agree with that with some of the other groups, the non-white extremist groups as well. Um, that, uh, that article that, that Dr. Grant and Dr. Chang and I wrote, we found that anti-Semitic content was present on about two-thirds of hate sites, and it was more common than rhetoric against any other group, blacks, gays, anybody else. Um, another thing that a lot of these groups have in common is they tend to define white very normally, or very narrowly. They have a very narrow definition of counts as white. If you're Jewish, you're not white. Basically, you're only white if you're Christian, and if your ancestors came from a very limited part of the world. Um, and so they have very limited definitions there. They also s tend to share a lot of other beliefs. They, almost all of them are very strongly anti-abortion. And as I, get, as I said before, some of them are affiliated with some of these militant anti-abortion groups. Almost all of them are anti-feminist. Um, almost all of them are anti-liberal. They hate those. And almost all of them are anti-gay. In fact, some of the anti-gay rhetoric is, is, is extremely strong, and I, I read you just a little bit on the one site. Um, we found, and other researchers have found, that a lot of these groups reach, have been reaching out to one another, and I think that the internet has improved their ability to be able to do so. You know, it's really easy to email somebody, and you can just put a link up on your website. So there, there's a lot more, I think, interconnections among them than there used to be and also a lot of connections between these groups in the United States and groups abroad. We found, I think, about half of the, the websites had links to groups in other countries. And that's why you see clan groups in Australia and, and these connections, some of these groups. The Aryan Nations has a whole, they call it their Islamic outreach arm. And they have, they're, they're trying to bring in Muslims because, uh, again, this, this, they think they can be united in hating Jews. Um, and these groups in general share a lot of the same product. You can go to their websites or read their pamphlets and things and they're saying the same kinds of things. They're reprinting the same things, the same sort of classics of, of racist literature you see popping up on lots of different kinds of sites. An interesting thing, and this is some work that uh, Dr. Grant and Dr. Chang and I have been doing more recently, is focusing on the role of women within organized hate. People tend to think of hate, when you think of Organized hate, you probably think about men. And, and, and a lot of scholars who have written about it have referred to as a men's movement. And I, I think there's two reasons for that. One is almost any, every famous leader 
you can men in, in organized hate is male. I mean, I've mentioned to you a lot of names today and not a single one of them is a woman. And so there's that. And the other thing is, if you look at the rhetoric, a lot of it is very strongly anti-feminist. They, they very much are strongly, we find that almost all of the, a, a lot, the, the, the most common image we found of women on these websites was sort of women as mothers and wives, and there's you know, somebody who, you know, this sort of idealized, very traditional women's role type of thing. Um, the truth is actually women have historically been very involved in hate. Back in the 20s, there were women's clans. During World War II, there was a, a there was an anti-war movement called Mothers Against Hate that was also anti-Semitic. Um, today, as many as half of new members of hate organizations are women. So there are a lot of women. They, they may not be uh, the very vocal leaders where we can see them, but that doesn't there. And in fact, the people who have researched women and hate think that women serve as the social glue for these organizations. It's the women who do the, the cooking and the baking, so somebody makes the cookies and the punch for the meetings, and it's the women who organize the entertainment, and it's, you know, the men may show up, but it's the women who provide sort of the social aspect of it, as is true. And if you think, those of you who belong to churches or other kinds of groups, it tends to be women who, who fill those ro roles, and the same is, is true in white supremacism and extremism. Um, another thing is, even if you subscribe to those traditional ideas about people's roles, it's women who are gonna raise the kids. And if you wanna raise racist kids, you better make sure that their mothers are racist. Additionally, um, there's a bunch of, or at least some research showing you know, with, on why people leave these groups, and they find that the, the turnover rate for hate groups is very high. People join them and then they, they don't tend to stick around. And one of the main reasons that men leave is because their girlfriends or wives aren't supportive. Um, Women who join tend to kind of bring their husbands and boyfriends with them, but men, if their girlfriends or wives aren't supportive, they tend to drop out of the movement. So if you want to keep the men, you better get the women in. Um, and so women are very important to the racist movement. Um, some, of, some of these groups have special propaganda aimed specifically at women. Some of them have websites or web content created specifically for women and in some cases by women. So there is some focus on it. There's not a lot of research on this out there, though. So it's an interesting area. The last thing I wanted to talk about about organized hate groups is recruiting. And as I just mentioned, turnover for these groups is very high, so it's really important for them to recruit. Research indicates that almost everyone who joins these groups joins because they were recruited in. They didn't go out looking for the group to join, but somebody came from that group. So they said, hey, you might be interested, why don't you come to this meeting type of thing. So they're, so they're recruited in. So recruiting is very important. And what I think surprises most people a lot is why people join these groups. People not join hate groups because they're racist. I mean, the obvious idea is, well, you know, you're really racist, so you think, okay, I'm gonna go join the Klan. But let me repeat it, people don't, don't join hate groups because they're racist. What happens is they gradually adopt racist views because they've joined. Which isn't what we might expect. But what happens is people join these groups for the exact same reasons that all of us join the groups that we've joined. You know, a lot of you probably belong to clubs and churches, you know, fraternities, sororities, all those kinds of social groups, and you think about why did I join that group? Well, at least part of it was, you know, you're looking for social ties, looking for people to hang out with, maybe some people who might have something in common, looking for entertainment, for support, um, for benefit, entertainment, childcare, whatever. Um, I, I wrote a book on hate crimes and I would talk about, when I moved into the house I lived in, it's in a brand new subdivision, and one of the neighbors came around from door to door trying to, you know, trying to talk everybody into joining her church. You know, she had a flyer and everything. and, and it, I couldn't get any sense from the flyer about what the church believed in. I, I don't have a clue what the church believes in, but the flyer goes on about, you know, we have free childcare and we have concerts and we, uh, the social stuff. And that's what brings people in. I assume if you joined this church, once you got there, they'd tell you what they believed in. The same thing sort of happens with these hate groups, is they bring people in who are looking for a place to belong, and once they get there, then they start teaching them hate, which doesn't say, which doesn't say that the people were, you know, paragons of love and brotherhood to begin with, but they weren't necessarily all that much more bigoted than any of us. But they were brought in, and then they were taught to, they are taught to hate. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut has a, has a wonderful term, grandfaloons, 
I don't know if you're very familiar with Kurt Van Floon is a group of people who really don't have very much in common, but they think they do. They think it's important, like, you know, oh, we, w we grew up in the same state or something like that. You know, hate groups are grand Floons. So people don't really have much in common, but they can get together and they can think, oh, we've got, we're, so, we're so wonderful, we have so much in common, because we're Aryan. Um, and so that, that's why people join. And the hate groups realize that, and they tend to focus their recruitment efforts on luring y on young people. And they do, I use the word luring because that's what they do. Start off by saying, and you can even see this on the, on the flyer, it doesn't say, you know, don't you hate blacks and Jews, come join us. <laughs> what it says is, you know, aren't you interested in standing up for your rights? Don't you love your own people? Aren't you interested in learning more about blah, blah? So the rhetoric at the, on the face of it is rather mild and they get people in and it's only later when you start to get the, the harsher stuff. And some of it is, is purposely misleading. Uh, the website is down at the moment. It might come up again. If it used to be up until very recently. If you went to www.mlking.org, which you know you can picture some junior high school kid doing a report on Martin Luther King, you got what looked like a website on Martin Luther King, and it had you know, pictures and everything else. And in fact, it looked a lot like the website that the King Organization runs. But as you start digging around, you find out in fact this website was on Stormfront, and it was. All sorts of horrible things about uh, you know about blacks and Jews, uh, really bad stuff. But it wasn't right there on the face. It, had, it was buried. I taught a, a freshman honors course a couple of years ago, and as an assignment, I had my students supposed to do a critical analysis of a web page, and I made them go to this one. And they were supposed to be critically anal analyzing it, and like looking at who wrote it and what their credentials were. Not a single one of my honors students realized that this was a white supremacist web page. Not one. Okay, college students. Not a, not a one. So they are purposefully misleading, and they, they will focus on people, again, who feel kind of alienated or lonely, feel like they need a place to belong. Um, and the internet is certainly being used for this. It's unclear exactly what role the internet is recruiting, but they certainly are trying to reach out to young people. They have these kids' pages. About half of the websites have some sort of multimedia content, like songs you can download or video games. There's an ethnic cleansing video game and some others. Um, you know, stuff that's really aimed, obviously, at young people. And speaking of young people, I would like to finally turn now to talking about hate crime offenders. Um, there's not a lot of research on who actually commits hate crimes. Um, it's a hard thing to study. Officially, if you look at the police reports, which have a lot of problems, each year there are about nine or 10,000 hate crimes reported to the police in the United States and about 2,000 in California. Those are just the ones that are reported to, to the police. Many, many more happen, but don't get reported. Of those, very, very, very few end up in convictions. Um, in the year 2000, there were about 2,000 hate crimes in California reported. 213 people were convicted. So it just doesn't happen all that often. So we just don't know too much about it. Um, but I can give you an idea of what sort of the typical offender looks like. First of all, as I mentioned already, the typical hate crime offender does not belong to an organized hate group. Um, various studies have come up with different percents, but it's about only about 5 to 14 percent of hate crimes are committed by people who belong to organized groups. Um, they're young. The typical offender is in his early 20s. They're middle class. They're male, which doesn't to say that there aren't female offenders, but almost all of them are male. Um, the typical offender is white, although I should mention that certainly, by, by all means, not all offenders are white, and it's very common to see hate crimes committed by members of one minority group against another. Um, very frequently, people who commit ha hate crimes are do it while hanging out with their friends. They, very few people who commit acting all by themselves. They're in a small group, not, not an organized hate group or a gang, but just their friends. They're hanging out and they, and they do this. And most of them have had little or no previous contact with police or criminal justice. So these aren't like hardened offenders. Is that a question? Or? Um, there has been very little research on that, but they found that they're not any, in general, not any less well-educated. A lot of them are college students. In fact, a woman named Karen Franklin, who is in the Bay Area, did some research a couple of on community college students in California, and she found 10% of her students admitted that they had threatened or attacked a gay person at some point. So they're not 
any less educated. You know, we tend to think, you know, at the start, they're rednecks, or they're stupid, or they're uneducated, or they're ignorant, but that's not the case. Um, in fact, what's going on in most of the cases is they're young people, they're looking for something fun to do, they want to impress their friends, they want a little bit of excitement, and they do this, which isn't to say that they're not racist, not bigoted, but, they're, but they don't seem to be any more bigoted than the normal person. Some researchers named Levin and McDevitt did, uh, did a study several years ago now where they tried to categorize the types of hate crime offenders. And it's a little bit unclear um, how valid their study is. It hasn't been repeated elsewhere, but it's kind of a useful typology that the majority of the hate crimes were committed as what they called thrill seeker hate crimes. And what these were were just groups of people looking for fun, looking for excitement, looking for something to do. So you get a group of people that are hanging out together and often getting drunk. And well, let's go, let's go find a black person to beat up, or let's go beat up some gay people, or let's go, you know, paint some swastikas on the on the Jewish community center. Um, and they found, as I said, that this was the most common type of, uh, I'm trying to remember their percentages, and I don't off the top of my head, two thirds of hate crimes fell in this category. Other research has, has backed that up. Um, the second type of hate crime, they call defensive hate crimes, and these are crimes where people are reacting to some sort of perceived intrusion on their territory. Um, some, an example of this happened in Texas, in Galveston Bay in the 80s when a group of immigrants came from Vietnam and started doing some shrimp fishing, and the shrimp fishermen who were already there saw this as, as a threat to their livelihood. The Klan got involved and they started threatening and actually committed violence against the shrimp fishermen. Um, another couple of examples you might have heard of, heard of uh, Howard Beach in New York, this was quite some time ago now, um, where a, a couple of black men, their car broke down in a white working class neighborhood. They went to go get a piece of pizza while they were waiting for somebody to come give them a ride back home. And they started, a group of white people, just white young men started chasing them with baseball bats. One of these, one of the young black men ended up, he, he was in fear for his life and ended up getting run over by a car as he was trying to sewers and killed. Um, another example you might have heard was Bensonhurst. Um, in this case, uh, again, a, a young black man went into a white working class neighborhood in New York um, to buy a car. He was interested in buying a car and so a group of white people walked up to him and started giving him a hard time. One of them, a young man, took out a gun and just shot him in the head because he felt, you know, what are you doing in our neighborhood? And sometimes it can be, what are you doing in our neighborhood? We don't want you living in our neighborhood. You don't want you working in our neighborhood, that kind of thing. So those are the defensive hate crimes. The third kind they called retaliate crimes. And these are situations where somebody believes that members of another group have done something to their group, so they retaliate. Um, and the, the example, we all know this was the LA riots and the other riots that happened throughout the US at the same time. Another example you might have heard of also in New York was in Crown Heights. What happened was there was a motorcade rabbi that apparently hit and, and accidentally apparently, but did hit and kill a young black child, a seven year old kid. And um, rumors started circulating. This, new, this particular neighborhood was, uh, was Orthodox Jewish and black. And the rumors started circulating in the neighborhood that um, when the ambulance came, that the ambulance ignored the dying black child in favor of the, the rabbi because the ambulance was, was a Jewish ambulance and so forth. Uh, a Jewish, an Australian, young Jewish Australian who had come to New York to study was walking down the street. Um, a group of, of young black men saw him, said, there's a Jew, let's get him. One of them stabbed him to death. And in fact, he was just released from prison recently. So that's just the other day. So there's an example of a retaliatory hate crime. The final crime they said is the, the rarest kind of hate crime. They call these mission hate crimes. And this is where you get a single individual, sometimes somebody who is mentally ill or at least unbalanced, who sees it as their mission in life to rid the world of a certain person. And you've heard of these. Um, a few examples you may or may not have heard of. Mark Lapine in Montreal in 1989 felt that Women had done him wrong, walked into a college classroom and killed, I think it was 13 women. It purposely had all the women stand in one place and killed all the women, didn't shoot any men. Uh, Patrick Purdy, over in my neighborhood in 1989, uh, went into an elementary school uh, playground and purposely shot at um, kids who looked like they might be South while shouting out racial slurs, killed three children and injured a number of other kids and adults. 
Timothy McVeigh would fall into this category. Buford Furrow, who in 1999 first went to a Jewish community center in LA and opened fire, then uh, shot and killed a Filipino-American uh, uh, mailman. Um, he was incidentally affiliated with some of these organized, loosely with some of these organized hate groups. Benjamin Smith, also in 1999, went on a shooting spree in Indiana and Illinois, killed at people. Um, he just kind of randomly shot at people who looked like they were black or Asian or Jewish, and killed three people. And those, are, again, are the, the rarest kind of hate crimes. So that kind of gives you an idea, and I'm almost out of time, so br briefly let me tell you some conclusions so we have at least a few minutes for you to, make, to ask some questions. My conclusions are, first of all, um, unfortunately, hate is still alive and well, both in the United States and abroad. We like to think that from history, and apparently we haven't. Um, a second conclusion, hate groups will continue to evolve. It's an interesting area to study because as soon as you learn one thing, one group disappears because somebody dies or something, so they evolve in response to internal things, but also in response to external events like um, after 9-11, lots of stuff happened and those kinds of things, so, so they evolve. But the basic ideology remains the same. And the things that the hate groups are saying today aren't all that different than the things that they said 100 years ago. A third thing, and I think this is a particularly important one, is most hate crime prevention programs focus on reducing prejudice or focus on trying to get rid of hate groups. And I don't think either of these are apt to be very successful in reducing hate crimes. Because hate, the, it isn't the people who belong to the hate groups who are committing the hate crimes, although they're certainly influencing them. And as I told you before, people, most people who commit hate crimes don't do so primarily out of prejudice. Um, the fourth conclusion is we need more research. <laughs> I sound like a professor now, but we do. We need a lot more research on who joins these groups, why they join them, who offends, why they're offending, and how should we prevent this, this sort of behavior. And finally, and this is kind of my final word to you um, before I open it up for comments and questions, and I want you to come away. The, the people who commit hate crimes, it's easy to think of them as them, deviants. And the unfortunate reality is they are us in many ways. And now, questions, comments. Yes. Is the NRA at all affiliated with hate groups or hate crimes? Not officially, no. Certainly there are some NRA members who are especially involved with the militias, but, but no. But individual members, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so when you said that uh, there's been a move to these groups, that, um, that just made me wonder how, how much of that is, you know, their option. That's a really good question. That's a really good question, and one that, I'm, that nobody has researched, because one thing that Dr. Grant, Dr. Chang, and I found, although the official message of these groups is often, you know, women should be doing these traditional rules, if you dig a little bit deeper, the women involved in the groups aren't necessarily accepting those official messages. And so, they're, they're, so they're, you know, they may buy into it on the face so that they can work with the group, but I don't know that they're buying into it. So that's a really good question, one that's desperately in need of more research. She, she, you can maybe repeat it, but she was asking how much the, the, the women who are involved in these groups, since these groups are primarily anti-feminist, are the women there, is it sort of a matter of their involvement that they're being the social glue or that they're being forced into it? Yes? I can't. Yeah, that is a really good question, and, and nobody's asked me to define hate group either, which is a good thing because I, I don't have enough fun. Uh, the, the 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 edges are blur, blur, blurry. Certainly, the Branch Davidians were not a hate group. The only reason why I mention that is because the actions of the federal government in that is what inspired a lot of it. But generally, you can, what you see within, and it's hard because they tell them, a lot of them say, we're not a hate group, we just love our own people. Um, but a hate group in general is defined as, as somebody who is, is interested in maintaining traditional white power hierarchies. 
or other power hierarchies. Yes? There's a quote in a book. Somebody said that the United States is to people who study hate groups the way the, the Amazon rainforest is to people who study exotic flora and fauna. I mean, we just are particularly good. There are a lot of hate groups internationally. What distinguishes us from a lot of countries is the First Amendment. And uh, most of your countries, and Canada, and some other countries as well, have laws that prohibit these groups from being open. They can't put up websites, or distribute propaganda, or have rallies which doesn't mean they're not there, it just means they have to be more hidden. Here, they can be more in the open, and in fact, a, the internet allows a lot of these groups to put their stuff, uh, you know, now, if you're in Germany, okay, you can't own Mein Kampf in Germany, but you can get onto the internet and read it in German or English if you want to. So there aren't any really accurate tallies internationally, but certainly hate groups are, are, are um, very active, especially, it seems right now, in Central and Eastern European countries. Um, probably because of the economic strain those countries have been under and because of nationalism associated with the downfall of communism. Yes? <coughs> have you seen any correlation between the economics in a particular country and the rise of some of these groups or the rise of prominence in some of these groups? Yeah, good question. Um, in the and United States, need to repeat it because yeah, she was asking if if I've seen if there's been any correlation between economic state of various countries, either in the U.S. or abroad, and the rise of hate groups. And the answer is yeah. Um, there were some old studies that have since been somewhat discredited that showed a cor an inverse correlation between the price of cotton and the number of lynchings in southern states in the U.S. Uh, and some, I'm not an economist, so I don't understand any of this, but some more modern economists have sort of disputed that. But what we have seen is the 80s, the last time we were in a recession, is the time when hate group membership really skyrocketed. And they kind of, things were dormant for, now we're seeing a resurgence at this point. In Europe, um, what really had, um, in England, when they were having severe economic problems in the 70s is when we saw the skinheads and the other groups really rising up. And today, uh, so ever since the communism fell in the Central and Eastern European countries, there's, a very, it's com there's other factors going on too, but certainly a poor economy is a strong contributor. In your research, have you ever actually gone to any rallies or did any personal interviews with any of these people? I haven't. I've read literature, but I have not gone to, to their rallies. I, I, I've seen it more from the other, and I, the, uh, the uh, synagogue and the Jewish community center I belonged to when I was uh, growing up. Uh, the synagogue had to hire armed guards for the High Holy Days because of threats. Um, they were, they've been vandalized. So I saw it sort of from that end of knowing I haven't been brave. Some of the, a lot of the people who do research them have been brave enough to do that, and I haven't. Um, you mentioned <coughs> that anti-Semitism is what holds hate groups together. Yeah. And um, many of the students here have never really been exposed to any kind of anti-Semitism, and they find it uh, somewhat foreign or something that belongs in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. Can you explain just a bit about sure. why that might be the case? I'll, I'll kind of come at your question back as to why it might be the case. I think anytime you have a unified theme that makes your movement stronger, and this one is akin because there is such a long history of anti-Semitism, and you may be in a country where there are no black people, but there's at least a few Jews or a history of Jews. So, so I think that's why. as the, an interesting thing is, of course, most people, the, there aren't that many Jews in the United States or worldwide. So most people haven't had a lot of per, first, personal first-hand experience with Jewish people. And yet, so much of the official rhetoric of these groups is anti-Semitic. Uh, a guy named Ezekiel, who, who um, has written on this, and I'm trying to remember if that was one of the articles I gave you. Yes, yes okay, good. In, he, in, in one of his books where he, he studied that, he said, you know, it's really interesting. If you look at the official rhetoric, it's all anti-Semitic. But if you look at the individuals who belong to these groups, he, he was studying some um, neo-Nazis in Detroit. They had never met any Jews, but they were living in a black neighborhood. And so if you asked him, you know, he asked, well, what do, you, what do you not like about Jews? Well, they're running the world. Well, which Jews, can you name any Jews? And they couldn't name any, you know. But who they, you know, who they really felt strongly personally against were blacks, because that's who they had had interaction with. Um, but that's not a, a reason that's not strong enough to be a, a big, you know, maybe again because there's not such a history of it, I don't know. Yes? It's actually um, <clears throat> not really a question, but earlier someone just asked, uh, um, have you ever been to rallies and 
Yeah, yeah, that is a good book. Thank you. Would you would you repeat the name? Be, um, the author is Justice Stern, and the name of the book is Care in the Name of God: Why Religious Leaders Should. Thank you. Yeah, that is a really good book. If you're interested in other places to look, I'm going to put this is shame grass commercialism, I'm sorry. I wrote a textbook on hate, on hate crimes, but the reason why I'm mentioning it is if you're interested in other resources, you can go to my book and it's, a pretty, it's got a pr pretty comprehensive bibliography. It's, if you go on Amazon and look up Gerstenfeld, you'll find me, but the book is called Hate Crimes, Causes, Controls, and Controversies. And again, I'm not trying to make you go buy my book, but it's a, it, it's, I, I have a really complete bibliography and the book's only a year old, so it's, up to, it's pretty up to date. Also, Dr. Grant and I co-edited a reader on hate crimes, so if you're interested in kind of a beginning introduction to this, I have a plug for that. We have a copy of that book in the center. Oh good, so you don't have to buy it, because <laughs> I'm not getting rich off of it. <laughs> uh, you mentioned several times that there were a number of these folks that have been put away in prison. Is there any concern uh, about these folks, in fact, being put away in prison, and there they have this wonderful recruiting opportunity? Uh, how is that being addressed? I don't know if you could hear, she's asked, all these leaders are being put into prison, aren't they using that as a wonderful recruiting opportunity? And the answer is, yeah, they are. I mean, the hate groups have already been in prisons. And the other thing is they, they're martyrs for the cause now, which if anything only increases their, their possibilities. The prison system, as far as I know, has done very little to, to silence. I mean, they really, it's very difficult to silence even, even prisoners. And so you can go online even today and read what Ernst Zundel's been saying. He's, he gets released sometime this month, but he's still writing from prison. Sure, he's talking to his fellow prisoners. So yeah, so if anything, it's, it's a boon to these people to go to prison, especially when they're serving these very short prison terms. Metzger's gone to prison for a short time. You know, the, uh, Matthew Hale's gonna be in for a good long time, but the rest, it's these very short prison terms, so it's not enough to deter them or get them out of circulation, certainly. Yes? Do you feel that continual coverage of war and violence in the media establishes a precedent for violence? It, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg probe, isn't it? Um, certainly when we see images as associated with violence, I think that that does tend to encourage it in some people. And when you marry that with strong, fervent patriotism, um, you know, immediately after 9-11, hate crimes and incidents against Muslims, Middle Easterners, Arabs, anyone who looked as if they might be in any of those categories went way up and they continue to be way up. And I think that, that war, I, I was just listening to NPR on the way up here actually, and um, Philip Zimbardo, you might be familiar with his work at Stanford, referred, he said, you know, war is the vinegar barrel that ruins good young people. And that was a really good quote, <laughs> so I, yeah. Right. But I mean, I don't know, it kind of got me thinking about it because, you know, I would normally say you shouldn't have to be here what they say, but at the same time, I don't know. I'm really torn on this. I'm on the board of directors of my local ACLU chapter. <laughs> so, you know, I have st very strong feelings about the First Amendment. I'm skeptical about whether banning this kind of stuff gets rid of it. In a way, I'd prefer to see it. So I know, I'd rather have it out in the open so I know who's doing it and what they have to say because I don't think, I mean certainly in, we see it now in Europe, banning it hasn't gotten rid of it. And if anything, it only makes it more attractive because it's sort of the forbidden fruit. So because I'm a civil libertarian and because of that, I don't think that that's a good approach to take. I'm not sure what is a good approach to take. I, I'm Jewish and I feel left out because 
mainly they think that there's this vast Jewish conspiracy, and I'm left out because nobody's let me into the sea. Um, but I mean, but it's, it's a twofold thing. Uh, part of it is, especially the Christian identity people, it's theological based. Jews are bad because they're Satan. But the other part of it is they, they, they can blame Jews for everything. They can, in the same breath, blame the Jews for communism and capitalism. Um, and, and, they, and they all believe in this vast world conspiracy by Jews. And, so, and, and to them, people of color and are sort of the pawns that the Jews are using in their game. But it's the Jews you really want to worry about because, and you know, there's a lot of, that's been written on anti-Semitism and why it's so strong. And I think part of it is, is that Jews are able, have been historically able to assimilate in a way that other minority groups haven't. So they're more of a threat. You know, we, we can see, you, know, you can't tell just by walking down the street that I'm Jewish. So I'm, a, in a way I'm, a, I'm sort of I'm a secret threat in a way. And, and I think that's part of it. Jews have been able to get power in a way that my other minority groups haven't been able to. So I think that's part of it. They're just seen as more of a threat. Thank you very much.